Let's get started with this dialogue on climate change, farming and bioenergy with our guests. So, I would like to invite to the podium Stefano Bozzetto, who is a farmer, a representative of CHIP and the board of the European Gas Association, member of, and um, advisor of CIB. Thank you, Stefano, for being here. Then Francesco Ferrante, vice president of the Kyoto Club, vice president of the Free Coordination, is a friend. Thank you, Francesco. Then two um, foreign guests, Professor uh, Lee Lind, who is a researcher at Dartmouth College, expert in the use of vegetable biomass for the protection of energy, founder of the Lind Research lab uh, that is active in research in the use um, of cellulose for the production of biofuel. Thank you very much, Professor Lind, for being here with us. He's just arrived. From South Africa, I guess? Where, where? Anyway, he flew here from, from Kenya. And Professor Jeremy Woods, who is a professor of bioenergy at Imperial College London. He's a member of the uh, very important platform expert in the natural system of carbon removal, bioenergy, and climate change. Thank you very much, Professor Jeremy Woods. So, I will hand the floor over to Stefano Bozzetto, who will introduce this panel, this very interesting panel that uh, is going to provide us with some food for thought. Food for thought for the following two panels. Uh, Lorella is here as well. Good morning. Could you please put the slides on? So we spent the morning with young colleagues who um, told us about their experience. I'm a farmer too. So talking about what we do is the most interesting thing. I have the difficult task, because I am no scholar here, to continue with this uh, tradition started by CHIB that has always wanted to exchange views with the academic world and with our international friends. We are putting our businesses at risk, our farms at risk. So it's very important to be pragmatic with respect to the environment, with respect to um, um, food security. This is one of the questions that has always bugged us, and um, we are unable to solve everything on our own in Italy. We need to have um, a shared experience. We need to have a shared approach in Europe, first and foremost, but also with our friends from overseas. So we have to share with them what we are doing. This morning, we heard from Ratan Lal, and then, of course, we will try to put everything he said into um, a context and the explanation of how renewable gas, so agroecology, and the fertilization of the soil. I don't know many uh, biogas promoters that are also organic farmers, but I can tell you that the uh, farms of biogas done right in uh, in Italy are the ones using organic fertilization more than anyone else. So we will try to um, ask five questions. And based on these five questions, we want to take stock of uh, what our industry is doing and uh, what are the challenges that we have to rise up to. Uh, challenges uh, not only for Italy, but challenges in the world. Bioenergy is the sector that has invested less than others in its uh, sector of renewables after a boom in the 1990s. Investments, if compared with solar or wind energy, have slowed down, with the exception of biogas in Europe. I asked Lee Lind, 
and I'm honored to have uh, here with us one of the ultimate experts of uh, cellulosic ethanol to tell us um, something more about his vision. So what's the state of play of the industry of ethanol, which might sound far from us, but it is very close. So please, Lee, the floor is yours. Thank you. It's a, a great pleasure to be here. Um, I think that the work you are doing is one of the shining lights internationally uh, at bringing the idea of the circular economy to the intersection of uh, energy and agriculture. I appreciate also that, as I understand it, uh, what you're doing uh, sort of goes from the farm to energy, and I think people have often sort of started with energy and then gone to the farm, and so I think that's a very healthy to sort of start on both sides of the river and, and build bridges towards the middle. Uh, my son and daughter-in-law are full-time farmers, and so... Uh, and I have two farm grandkids, and as you know, growing, growing up on a farm is a little bit different experience from growing up elsewhere. So I feel, uh, I hope I can take the liberty to feel at home. So, um, in a nutshell, and uh, Stefano showed, uh, we wrote this Nature Biotech paper in the end of 2017. You can go read what we had to say there about the last 10 years for cellulosic biofuels. Um, it was a rough 10 years, and in my opinion, the basic reason, uh, there are some other reasons, but people got very excited about this technology and sort of convinced themselves in a competitive atmosphere where everybody needed a bigger story than the next person that we knew all we needed to know in order to go implement and away we went, and we actually sort of stopped trying to learn new things and innovate and instead just look to deploy and scale up. I think it's very clear now uh, that um, the technology was not as ready as it was presented. And I think we need to, in a nutshell, I could say much more about this, but I think, you know, people speak of second generation, they abbreviate it by 2G. I think we need a 2G 2.0, uh, where we uh, refocus and realize that we have some things we need to make better. And I'd be happy to discuss this with you uh, offline. But I think that as, we, as the second generation liquid biofuel technology evolves, I think it's going to look more like biogas technology than it does today. I think in some ways that in a technological sense, the two are going to be convergent. Let me also say that it is possible for people in the biogas community, actually I'll start with my own community, it's possible with people from the cellul liquid cellulosic biofuels community to uh, adopt a... <coughs> maybe an adversarial relationship with the biogas people because we're competing for investment and all of that, and vice versa. But I'm absolutely certain that the, to the extent that each of these does better, the other does better, and I would urge us to, to take a uh, collective uh, approach. There are a couple of slides I want to show you, if I may. Um, yeah, oh good, I can just barely see that one of them's up there, and you can see me craning my neck up there. So. I show a picture there of the carbon cycle, and as you're very, very aware, um, there is this potential to uh, move carbon as, uh, as we would in a circular economy. There are arguments that I try to summarize there very briefly, and I'm not going to read those words to you, but you're all familiar with them. There's the indirect land use art change argument. There is the, um, the argument having to do with... Um, the time lag that happens if you, if you clear forests. You, you've seen all of those. And they have been presented in the literature as if they are inescapable, that, that those are just things that make bioenergy. And by the way, all of those have to do with land, and so it doesn't... Thank you, Jeremy. It, it doesn't much matter whether... Uh, for, for the purpose of these arguments against bioenergy it doesn't much matter what you're making because they all have to do with, the things have to do with the land before you actually make biogas or uh, liquid fuels or, or what have you. So these have been presented as if, you know, game over. It's, it's a bad idea. Every single one of them, if you assume that we, for the moment, you assume that we actually had the intent to do things sustainably, every single one of those alleged gotchas is avoidable. Every single one. And... Um, I'm involved, as many of you are, with people that are trying to 
articulate those arguments. This is not the time to go into them in detail. But I would like to bring up one point that I think is very fundamental. So one of the statements up there on the slide is that, you know, for all that the indirect land use change argument has done to prevent uh, the expand and impede the expansion of biofuels of all kinds, actually, if we're talking about cellulosic feedstocks, if I can go to the next slide, thank you. Uh, so there's a summary of recent literature on ILUC uh, for cellulosic feedstocks. And again, calculation of ILUC has nothing to do with what you make with the cellulosic biomass. It has to do with how you produce the feedstock. And in a nutshell, um, the arguments cluster around zero, and there are, as many, arguments, there are many, as many reports for cellulosic biomass that point to ILUC as having a net mitigation effect. That is, that the indirect effects have a net mitigation effect there are as many reports that, that uh, indicate that as indicate um, that it has a net emission effect. And I won't go into it, but let us just say that there are many variables having to do with how you use land that have a much, much, much larger effect. What te conversion technology you use, whether you do carbon capture and storage, one form of which is in soil carbon. Um, these have a much bigger effect, in some cases order of magnitude bigger effect than the standard deviation of current ILUC estimates for cellulosic biomass. So um, I think given that, the, uh, there's sort of a disproportionate response. Let me end my comments with just one little, I think, instructive story. And the moral of this story is that, you know, <clears throat> we tend to label things as this or that, and everything depends on how we do them. Uh, and so the example has to do with corn ethanol, maize ethanol, which I'm not particularly used to uh, defending or advocating. I'm well aware of its weaknesses. And I would comment, though, that I'm, I'm involved in a study that is, originates from Brazil and is now under review. And we apply sort of the normal metrics about, you know, carbon energy, energy balance, net greenhouse gas emissions, and indirect land use change to maize ethanol as it's occurring in Brazil. And keep in mind, if there's one biofuel the world thinks they know all about and has sort of, you know, put somewhere on the good to bad spectrum, it's probably maize ethanol. There are a tremendous number of papers on the subject. But it turns out the way Brazil is doing it, not because they set out to, frankly, but for various market reasons, maize ethanol in Brazil scores famously. It has close to zero net greenhouse gas emissions, and it actually has negative indirect land use change. By the way, from what I've heard today, I'm pretty confident that what you're doing has negative indirect land use change. And what I mean is, it takes more hectares to grow food without what you're doing than it takes to grow food with what you're doing. So to the extent that indirect land use change is an issue, it should work for this group, not against you. But in any case, returning to the Brazilian study, the reason the greenhouse gas emissions are so favorable is that for purely market reasons, they use eucalyptus rather than fossil fuels to power the process. And eucalyptus has a short enough cycle, especially in Brazil, that there's not a long time between uh, harvest and, and regrowth of the next cycle. The reason the indirect land use change, uh, this should sound familiar, the reason the indirect land use change is negative is because in Brazil, uh, the maize is being produced as a double crop with soybeans. And so, again, it would take more land, since you get from the maize ethanol, you get some feed byproduct. It would take more land to provide for agricultural needs in the uh, absence of maize ethanol in Brazil than in the presence of maize ethanol in Brazil as it's being done. My purpose here is not to champion that particular process, but just to say everything depends on how we do it. And if we act with intent... We can integrate agriculture and energy in a way that's compatible with the circular economy. I look forward to meeting and discussing uh, with as many of you as I can. Thank you. Uh, perhaps some of you are aware First of all, I would like to ha have you a round of, uh, give you a round of applause to the um, Cavaliere. And if uh, we have uh, a project which in the next few years 
is going to attract so many investments in the field of second generation biomethane. We owe it to this to this entrepreneur, Cavalier Guilvisolvi. As you know, he died. And I was lucky enough once to meet him and uh, I asked him why in Crescentino, near where you live, while a biorefinery for cellulosic ethanol was being established, all of a sudden, all around, uh, some biogas plants were being established as well. Well, the two technologies, I think, at world level can coexist, but uh, there are three elements that I think mark the fact that in Europe, biogas, this is the statistics for biogas use in the utility sector, um, whereas this is the production um, of my biomethane. Well, this has continued to grow. I will summarize this with three elements, and we are lucky enough here to have Jeremy and other speakers. So we will have an opportunity for exchanges, but anyway, there are three elements which I think are essential um, in the fact that biogas is an industry that slowly is continuing to grow and that if it were to grow also abroad we would be even stronger. It is a patent free technology, a low cost technology and it is a natural process. Um, biology comes from cutting waste. It can be implemented at a low scale so even though if the plant in Crescentino was a pilot plant uh, and it cost over 100 million but uh, these others are investments that are uh, um, smaller you've heard the young uh, farm and some of them spoke about 30 million euros uh, investment so these are sizable investments but still something that farmers can grapple with and then the gas grid, uh, the gas grid that gives us an opportunity, um, first of all, the aspect of planning things out because, as Luca was telling us this morning, we have the, ch the chance to uh, store gas on an hourly basis, but once you get on the grid by using the distribution, and storage gas network, we can deseasonalize our production. Uh, for instance, as cattle breeders, what do we do when you take the sun of the summer and you capture it to use it in the winter in plants? Well, with the world of cellulosic ethanol, we do not just have the biotechnologies, uh, but we have also other things. This uh, slide really has to do with the negative mood that revolves around our sector. It has been going on like this for 10 years. I was presenting this slide in 2000 something, I think 2008 in Amsterdam, um, when I entered the European Biogas Association. And Bion Energy is a carbon loser. This is what we heard. This is. Uh, Team Searching uh, is the person who invented the iLook theory. And this slide allows me to introduce a second theme, a theme, and I would like to ask Francesco Ferrante to expand on it. Yes, Stephanie, if we may explain what iLook is, because not everybody is familiar with it. Well, the iLook. I don't want to get too technical, but well, this has, has to do with our daily lives. So it depends all on this. Uh, this is an acronym, and it means uh, indirect land change, land use change. Uh, 
And what happened in the literal application of this theory? Well, on Nature, so one of the main international journals, um, in December, an article was published according to which organic farming, uh, because it produces less than conventional agriculture per hectare, um, owing to indirect effects that it produces by forcing somebody else to eliminate a wood uh, in order to compensate for that uh, lack of production. So organic farming is more polluting than uh, conventional agriculture. So because this is uh, an uh, idiotic and because this theory is applied uh, correctly, the question that I am willing to ask Francesco, but then if now Bolsonaro has decided to open the native areas in the Amazon to soy crops, we, European agri farmers, to carry out sustainable agriculture, whose debts should we be paying for? First of all, I wish to thank you for inviting me. Uh, uh, I'm particularly happy this year because this morning you gave me the chance of seeing some hope because I saw four young farmers who are very good, actually excellent. So I have this hope. I hope that, you know, uh, that in the future we I will be able to speak with people who are a bit more um, you know optimistic after the other people have been dealing with for the past few years yes what you said is uh, absurd of this thing you said uh, it's a paradox that theory is um, foolish completely but the I look is for you a problem. It always was to the point that you were speaking about it 10 years ago, but it's not entire a folly really because otherwise we will not, you know, be realistic because it starts from a, an actual problem, a real problem, and uh, not so much in our part of the world, but all over the world it has caused huge problems. So, because I, I, if I have to explain this to farmers, those who produce crops and food uh, for their own farm, I have to explain to them that this was a big problem. So how can we deal with it in the right way? I have to go back for a moment uh, because I met you uh, almost 10 years ago, I think, and uh, uh, before I was no expert in farming, I was uh, dealing with energy-related issue, issues and uh, sometimes intuition works. So when we passed that reform, I was in Parliament at the time, the, the reform that led to the first uh, uh, creation of biogas plants in this country, we realized that there might be some problem. We wanted to produce biogas. Uh, renewable energy sources, but we realized that there might be some problem. And with Mr. Ronki, because we promoted this reform together, we started establishing some constraints which were a bit approximative, like the short cycle, 70 kilometers uh, in terms of the right use of the area. So it wasn't a really uh, something scientific, but there was this intuition. And particularly, I remember and later, Daviana Simina is going to participate in the round table. And at the time, I was also the director of Legambiente. And Legambiente, we were saying that this issue of um, bioenergies is um, something positive, but we need to be aware and make sure that bioenergy is left in the hands of farmers. So farmers have to be the protagonists. Um, of the fact that farming as well um, 
is less and less a producer of emissions. We know that farming at the lo glo lo global level um, produces emissions and plays a part in global warming. But at the same time, farming can, agriculture can become something different, an essential element in our common fight against climate change, provided that little, uh, it is left into the hands of the farmer. So if the farmer is the protagonist of this reconversion, then I met you guys and I came to know Biogas Don't Right, these double crops, and we delved deeper uh, into that intuition that was not scientifically grounded, but now it is, and we realized how this practice of the double crop is not just something that allows us to produce renewable energy, but as we heard from the young farmers this morning, uh, makes it possible to promote farming entrepreneurship uh, locally at the local level because without uh, these plants, these farms would not be there. The, the young guy people told us. And it also makes it possible to protect the soil, um, which is so, which is essential um, based on what Stefano said and also based on what we heard this morning uh, from the videos. So that challenge of climate change is something that we cannot tackle you know, this problem of the 1.5 degrees that we cannot exceed in terms of rising temperatures, otherwise changes may be irreversible. Well, we do that by focusing strongly on renewable energy sources and by reducing our emissions and, and getting to... But in the light of those dynamics and in the light of all the resources we have used, if we do not find a way of reabsorbing the CO2 that we have um, uh, released into the atmosphere, so because uh, we uh, environmentalists are very much against the possibility of making economic investments for carbon sequestrations at an industrial level, the only type of carbon sequestration that we like is what you guys do. Then, so um, this is a way in which we can answer to that uh, idiot, idiotic statement uh, in an intelligent manner, according to which, uh, you know, but organic farming is more polluting than traditional farming. Because in that case, of course, you do not take into account some parameters because uh, Bozzetto is right in saying, well, you are those who use more organic uh, fertilizer than anybody else, but that is related to pollution. Yes, I would say yes. So that is why I'm happy to speak about these things and possibly with the youngest people, you know, no offense meant, of course. This is pure discrimination, I'm afraid, on the part of Francesco. Mm. It, uh, so thank you very much, Francesca, for those, for those comments. It, it uh, seems clear to me that, and as you'll see as I talk a little bit later, that without finding ways for the world to incentivize in high carbon landscapes and low carbon pathways for energy provision, we will not be able to resolve uh, climate change. We will not be able to find the right pathways. At the moment, the discussion seems mostly set up to penalize farmers for food production and the things that they do with food production and to think about energy separately. And so I completely agree with, with, with what you've just said, Francesco. I, I completely agree that we need to find ways to reconcile <coughs> this, to help you as farmers do the right things in agriculture that increase carbon levels in the soils, that increase carbon stocks on the land, and at the same time provide more services to humanity. So it was said that the ILOC theory is grounded, is well-founded, and we need to recognize 
that a big chunk of the amount of emissions we created is also related to the change in soil use. Um, and uh, so we heard that because of this, there has been a change in carbon, and we can pass from debt to credit. This is the first time we speak about it before an audience, and it seemed crazy in the past. But before we can say how we can produce this credit, we from the biogas don't right must say something, and it's that you don't. If you don't change the way in which we farm, then bioenergy uh, has no purpose. This is the problem in our farms. In other words, I I'm not I'm not going to talk about a specific crop, but without changing the way in which we farm, we are part of the problem, and as a consequence. We cannot take part in participating in funding a solution. Professor Bruce Dale said business as usual is not an option. So we need some radical action also in the short term. And Ratan Lal told us this morning uh, in nature there is no there is no free lunches. If you move carbon from here to there, you really don't solve the problem. So in this connection I wish to ask you, and this is perhaps the most difficult question, um, and it's difficult, particularly for cattle raisers. This is not an easy question, but so we so why in South America today they continue to eliminate forests, they promote uh, uh, deforestation. So there is a demand in uh, for the protein which is out of control with 10 billion people. We need to say that we cannot continue uh, continuing to increase the supply of animal products. So in meat products. So for instance, my daughter does not eat vegetables, but she eats tofu. Um, so in young people, there are um, changes, food changes, and we see that in the markets of food, uh, of meat and dairy. Well, biogas can also be helpful in this connection. Think about a rotation with uh, some plants, uh, leguminous plants, also for human uh, feeding, but also, you know, as fodder in order to not to depend on Brazil, which is what Europe does. So it is the demand from our stables that creates deforestation. So can we do something? And because the minister is coming here, can we ask him to make some plan for Italian, for proteins in Italy and in Europe? And then biogas can play a part in this. And I will ask this to our guests. Francesco. Well, biogas, yes, can play a part, I am sure. And I would like to uh, ask another question for our minister, because it is something that Bozzetto has been asking me over and over, the issue whereby this, uh, this Italian practice, uh, this Italian experience, which is so important, has not been fully understood or uh, replicated uh, internationally. With Piero Gattoni, we went to to um, meet uh, a great spokesperson for the European Greens, uh, who is also their candidate uh, as president of the Commission, a, a good uh, European MP, Bas Eigen, and uh, we went to see him and try to try to, and explain why in uh, our opinion it was essential and I su supported this as an environmentalist and Pierre as a farmer include in the European Directive on Renewable Energy Sources that double crops were 
an advanced biofuel well we did not manage to do that and uh, well not as much as we wanted to at least or less than we wanted to uh, because at the European level this is something that has not been fully understood not just uh, by uh, our neighbors uh, but also in Northern Europe this is something that they do not feel fu fully convinced about and I would like to tell our minister and those who will speak to him should ask him this question please because what Stefano says is true that, in, that biogas can be helpful what we need is um, and I know that this sounds a political statement but we do not need um, to attack Europe uh, and come out and leave Europe uh, uh, exit it but we have to be more present in Europe and uh, support much more the positive practices that this country is developing when they are positive of course um, and an example of the past few months is quite similar and it has to do with plastic the directive is being approved is being passed it is a directive against and I'm quite very happy about it it's against single-use plastic uh, but uh, in that same directive we tried to include the fact that for instance for instance in Italy there is another best practice another intuition in other words those who produce plastic biodegradable ones and that can be composted and we were not able to convince Northern Europe that it would be useful to promote that type of biodegradable plastics that is produced here so if the in industry instead of being called Novamont it was called Nofamont and Stefano was called Bozzetten instead of Bozzetto, so a German sounding name. Maybe in Europe these things would count for more. So, what I would like to ask politics today is to allow Italian best practices to have a greater clout because you do these things despite all the difficulties. But well, these practices should not be carried out in spite of, but they should become something advanced that should be taken up by everyone. So the future of biofuel will be much similar to uh, the way in which you do biogas today. So should we bring this forward or not? Well, this is one of the questions we would like to ask. Thank you. Uh, any, other, any suggestion? Okay. Um, L'intervento di Ratan Lal. So, um, Ratan Lal this morning laid stress on the importance of arable land. Well, I'm um, a um, conventional farmer, so NPK. I didn't uh, know what's the current price of euro. Uh, I used to know that in the past. I don't know what's the current price. I have no idea. Well, evidently, in addition to saving, I've also discovered the importance, just like you did, of uh, land. We began measuring um, how much carbon does in our soil. And we're doing that thanks to a seed company that is doing that for free because we have no other support in, uh, in this regard. No scientific support, I mean. So please, let's give new momentum to public research in agriculture in Italy. We need it. We need it desperately. Well, in doing so, some of us who are better, who are smarter, have began um, measuring practically everything. So what did we infer from that? That it's not digested and all, and, 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 and 
digested only or double crops, but precision farming, the accurate use of digested and of course um, even seeding, you don't have to lose the moisture of the soil, otherwise the double crop is not going to be good. So we have learned a number of things. And we have learned to see that carbon in the soil, especially us from the Mediterranean, that we that, that have little of it. For example, I have land uh, in uh, in Ferrara and soil has 2% uh, of organic matter. My colleagues in Bavaria have 3-4%, but um, that's near the stable. But in the land, far from the stable, is 0.8%. So according to FAO, categorization is like a desert. So we found out that that reservoir is being filled. It's easier for us from the Mediterranean uh, countries because it's pretty empty, but we are doing that. We are filling it nonetheless. So the 1.5 degree um, IPCC report is posing a problem for us all. We have to hurry. We have to hurry because the carbon budget that we have currently available, and Luca Mercalli has talked about that this morning, is not being questioned. It's a fact. It's physics. If we believe in science, we must believe in what science is telling us today. And to be fast and to hurry, I think we have to start from experiences that have proven to be successful. Successful. So we have to enhance the fertility of the soil. It is a way to produce more, better products, but it's also good for the environment. And I would like Jeremy to introduce uh, this uh, notion from a climatic standpoint. Thank you. Is this one working? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Stefano. So I think um, when, we look at, when we look at this slide, we begin to understand just how important uh, land-based terrestrial systems are in managing climate change. And we begin to start to think, and it's beginning to emerge in the, in the academic literature, that we really need to concentrate on that, on that previous slide on what's called nature-based or natural climate solutions. And that means the growth of plants and the exploitation of plants. And that brings food and forests into the equation very strongly. Um, I put up this slide because I think the Paris Agreement really was a sea change in representing it. Up until the Paris Agreement in, in 20, at the end of 2015, the two, the, two degrees C, uh, the two degrees centigrade temperature warming target was seen as a sort of fuzzy target, a not very precise target, quite difficult to get to, but a, an interesting political idea more than a scientific certainty or a scientifically founded uh, target. After Paris, we began to understand that a real revolution was required. And after Paris, we, understood, we started to understand the nature of the change that is required, not just in European systems, but across the world. And it's a frightening concept. It really is frightening. And it's really starting to make it into the academic perceptions, into the theoretical perceptions. And now we need to move them out of the theory and into practice. And so what you see with this graph here is the trajectory of European Union emissions. And I can sit here and tell you that the European Union is the most effective and the most progressive in the world in terms of reducing its emissions. So you see a graph here of the European Union trajectory pathways at the top there, leading down to the 40% reduction target there in 2030. And I don't know if you look at the solid line, you can see that it already looks quite challenging to get to that 40% reduction target, but the European Union is more or less on target. If you now follow the line down to 2050, you can see the, 20, the original 2050 goal over on the right-hand side and then below it is the 2050 high ambition goal for the European Union. And you start to see that these targets look incredibly challenging for the European Union to meet. Not only do they look incredibly challenging for the European Union to meet, they cannot be met by focusing exclusively 
on the energy sector, on greenhouse and reducing emissions from the energy sector. And now we know that far from just reaching those targets, we actually have to get to net zero by 2050. Next slide, please. And so late last year, in fact, at the end of November last year, the high-level panel of experts that the European Commission had convened reported on its eight low-carbon pathways that it believes can get Europe to that net zero position by 2050. And here's the report. And the only thing I want to highlight in this report is the, is the thing circled there, up there. And that's that the high-level panel of experts reported back to the European Commission and the European Parliament and said, unless you include a circular bioeconomy in your calculations, unless you do the kinds of things that you, as the Confederation of Italian Biogas Industries are doing, and unless you accelerate those activities, you stand no chance of reaching those kinds of targets. Next slide, please. So, I don't know, Francesca, did you want, uh, sorry, Stefano, did you want to talk to this slide? Uh, no, uh, it, um, penso che, um, il, I'm sorry? I, I can talk to it if you want. I, I, you have to continue it? I can do if you want, or would you prefer to? No, no, let's go. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. So, uh, sitting on top of that target and the need to bring the bioeconomy, to bring agriculture and forestry into the emissions reductions targets, as I've said, this is not exclusively about Europe. The whole world has to find ways to do it. And that's why it's so important that we, we expand the light that you are shining on this sector. But absolutely critical to those, to those arguments, <clears throat> and excuse, I've just uh, finished examining a, a PhD thesis from India where exactly the same discussion and arguments are being happened. Absolutely critical to those arguments about meeting those extremely challenging greenhouse gas emissions reductions pathways, increasing carbon in the terrestrial systems, is the ability to manage carbon in the soils. And central to that argument is that when you do manage and increase the amount of carbon in the soils in agriculture, you increase resilience of agriculture to climate change, you increase the carbon stocks, and you increase the, the nutrient ability of the soils to retain nutrients and decrease uh, soil erosion. Next slide, please, Lorella. Ah. So, th no, this slide, thank you. So once that argument has started to be accepted in both the academic system and then the political system, we need then to start to grapple with the reality of the agricultural systems and the forestry systems. And that means a huge increase in innovation and in knowledge in agriculture and in forestry. And again, everything I've seen, and I've now come to three, this is my third uh, Biogas Italy conference, everything that I have seen, you, you're, you as the farmers in this grouping who are producing biogas, you are demonstrating the range of knowledge and the range of innovation that is, being, that is required to achieve this. But this graph simply shows the scale, and I'm afraid it's too complicated to go through in any detail, but that there are so many different factors involved in improving, in improving the organic matter levels and the soil carbon levels and improving yields and improving the resilience of agriculture and, agri and the forestry system that are required to increase the carbon stocks on land. Thank you, Lorraine. Next slide, please. So, uh, that's over to you then. Okay. So. <laughs> Thank you. Vorrei provare a, a, a concludere per poi chiedere. So, I will try to draw a few conclusions and then I will ask our friends to make a final comment. So, what is our challenge? Which is the challenge of um, agriculture done right. So, Ratan Lal reinforced this point this morning. We have to produce more using less or more efficiently. We have to use our resources, water, nitrogen and soil more efficiently. 
I don't know where's my president. I can't see him. Well, Piero is a genius, so let's give him a big hand. So, you know, there are people that acknowledge the importance of our managers. So we have two great managers. We truly have. Well, when I um, talked to Piero, Piero had no doubts. Well, usually French people and Italian people don't get along that much, but we were the first uh, organization to join the Quatre Pour Mill movement. And the Quatre Pour Mill began when a farmer, Le Foll, that was his name, well, is a socialist, but uh, it doesn't really matter, went to Ohio and said, is it really possible? Next slide, please. Is it really possible? Because you will uh, find all different versions of this, but let's come to to see us. Let's come to our, to our farm to see what's happening. And uh, Ratan Lal um, told us this morning that we have to take a carbon balance. Um, a carbon budget, so we focused on tons of euro, but we have to use those maize stocks to produce energy on condition that you return something to the soil um, in equivalent of uh, uh, greater amounts because the biome of the soil needs to be fed and its energy is carbon. So we have to create a positive carbon budget. For example, the problem of American academics and, and still don't know very well what Digest It is about. So we had the honor for Ratan Lal to start exchanging views with us and hopefully next year is going to be here with us in person. It would be a great honor for us all. But. Um, Biochar and compost are gains. Um, then cover crops, um, crop residues, and everything we produce in the subsoil. So the more we produce in agriculture, and in this regard, Tim Searchin is right. We need to produce more in arable land, not less when it's criticizing organic farming. But for example, when it comes to maize, 70% we take home, 30% um, is in the roots. So this is what contributes to a positive budget. Then we've got leaching and then uh, uh, erosion or decomposition if we plow or if we till the land. We oxidize less. Well, this is a challenge from a cultural standpoint. Last year, we celebrated the funeral of the plow. And um, you can see a monument to the plow um, as if it was over. But um, I've tried to tell my neighbors I live in the countryside. And well, the plow is uh, something uh, sacred. You can't touch it. So the idea that it can have a negative impact on agriculture is something very far from traditional culture. But we need to work very hard to make people understand that the plow is no longer useful. Well, I confess that um, well, um, I have celebrated the funeral of my plow, but sometimes I need it. So in agriculture, one plus one doesn't always um, uh, make two, but sometimes it's three or three and a half. So what I want to point out is that this is a slide taken from the um, presentation delivered by Ratan Lal in 2018 in the US. And um, he um, gives us a flavor of what we can do. And that's what we can do. We are safe at 350 ppm when we approved the Kyoto Protocol a few years ago. I think that, that was the threshold. Now it's 410 ppm, and we're not safe at all. There are only two ways now. 
to go back. Industrial capture, it's not up to me if that's realistic or not, and photosynthesis. Let's not be afraid of photosynthesis because producing more in agriculture means capturing carbon. And to sequester it, the first thing that we need to do is to capture it. And then we need to sequester it. And it's convenient in the countryside for us, especially in the Mediterranean countries. So the message I would like to give to Italian politicians is that we have land that has 0.8, 0.7% of carbon. So we have to recover the first infrastructure for farming. That is agricultural soil, so arable land. And Rattan Lull gives us a flavor of uh, what we have to do in order to rise up to this challenge. So if we increase photosynthesis, if we use the soil to improve its fertility, which is not bad, it's not going to be harmful. We can recover 157 ppm. That's the scope of the challenge. It's a scientist telling us. So I think we can trust him. And so we should keep doing what we are doing in the countryside. So I would like to ask you to make a final comment so we can conclude uh, this panel. Jeremy, please. Thank you very much, Stefano. So <clears throat> I think we have uh, all the ingredients that, that we need to see, we need to understand, built around your biogas example, to show how the agricultural system globally can start to move in the direction that's needed, but it needs to, to not just start, it needs to move very fast in that, in that direction. Um, I thought I might just finish my comments by talking about the Brazilian system strangely. So we're working quite hard with the Brazilian sugarcane industry about the implementation of biogas into the Brazilian sugarcane industry. And one of the key reasons that they want to introduce biogas into their industry is in order to control water quality and to meet new water quality standards, but also to help manage water in the land and water in the sugarcane production system through soil improvements and then improve, improve yields for sugarcane. We're seeing that in Brazil, and I hope that we will see anaerobic digestion and biogas production become a cornerstone to new agricultural movements, new changes in agriculture around the world. And um, I've just returned from a meeting in Ethiopia where bioenergy is starting to be seen as a real tool to help improve agricultural production, agricultural practice. But I just want to make one final point, and that sitting on top of all of these really quite academic discussions is exactly the same point and the same question that we will not be able to move to the pathways, the low carbon pathways that, that we're talking about, unless we find ways to incentivize the people on the ground, the people working the land, the people producing the land, and allow them to retain value and provide incentives for them to change practices in order to be able to move on to these new pathways. I thought I'd leave it with that. Yeah, so we're all trying to find, I think, different ways to say the same thing. And I'm going to come at this from sort of a philosophical point of view. You know, let's imagine our great-great-grandchildren a couple hundred years from now when they're adults and they're looking back and they're asking, so, you know, in 2020 or so, what should people have been thinking about harder than they were? And I think that there are, globally speaking, two things. I think one of them, the phrase revolution has been used. I think one of them is, I like to call it the sustainable resource revolution. It's not only energy, it's not only agriculture, it's water, it's, it's the whole thing. But it basically amounts to being able to live off of our resource income rather than our resource capital in whatever context you have. And in addition to the sustainable resource revolution, the other one, it seems to me, is poverty. We live in a richer and richer world, and yet 
Uh, as the presentation uh, from Ohio State uh, showed this morning, we still have close to a billion people who are, who are food insecure and, and living very poor lives. 72% of the global population lives on less than 10 U.S. dollars per day, which is some people's budget for coffee. Um, and so we still live in a poor world, and yet we have lots and lots of ways, things we can do about that. And it seems to me that in both energy and with, oh, both, excuse me, in both the sustainable resource revolution, I think that agriculture, I feel confident that agriculture has a central role to play in bioenergy and in encouraging the circular economy. And I just came back from two weeks in East Africa, as it happens. In fact, I arrived this morning. Uh, but I've been in Kenya and Uganda and Malawi. And, you know, what's happening in these poor parts of the world where the food insecurity is concentrated is that there's very little way to generate value in rural economies. And so we need something better than the way that rural economies survive is to send their young people to the cities who send checks to their grandparents back in, in the rural places. So basically we need to get agriculture going uh, in, in those, those parts of the world. And so... It seems to me that agriculture has to embrace, has to realize that the agriculture, globally, the agricultural system we have now was not particularly designed to tackle these emergent problems of, of climate change. So we need to innovate, and I think that what's happening here is a wonderful example of that. And I think that we also need to take responsibility, as Stefano has said, we need to take responsibility for the whole thing. We need to take responsibility for the things that we fortuitously do well and the things that we haven't done, we don't do so well in agriculture because we, again, we didn't set out to uh, be part of this circular system in the same way that is now needed, although there have always been elements of the circular economy in agriculture, as any farmer knows. And so um, I, congrat I started and I will end by congratulating you I think that this is a, uh, your effort is a, a shining star globally, and um, it exemplifies, as Jeremy has said, it exemplifies many of the directions that the world needs to head. So, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, in these three final minutes, I would like to say something that is not necessarily related with what we have said so far. And this is also your last chance, so, you know, since you're here, say what you want to say. Well, I've already in part explained what I think. This is agriculture done right. This is what we need. It's even difficult to add uh, much to what authoritative speakers have said, Stefano and our academic friends. But I would like to use up these three minutes to f talk about obstacles against all these positive movements. Well, the first obstacle is represented by this misunderstanding uh, concerning I look, I think there's a basic misunderstanding here. And the other is, and it would not be honest not to mention it, is the issue of the social acceptability of these plants um, uh, on the territory uh, at the local level. So those who follow my tweets, which is the only social network I use, know that I am conducting a personal campaign on NIMBY against my own biomethane. It's basically waste-based plants that are affected by this, but there are some justifications that are paradoxical in this connection. There's a committee that is asking that the place where uh, a given plant should 
that's been built. Uh, there should be a change in the master plan saying that there, there is quality agriculture. Now, the issue is not that there is or there isn't. But if the master plan is changed and it says that there is agri quality agriculture, then the plant is not going to be built there at all. Or extremist uh, uh, parties saying that they will you know, go down on the streets against biomethane plants. So there is a flourishing of uh, idiotic uh, initiatives. Mm. And this is also the case in, with NIMBY, not in my backyard. Uh, I have to say this because we need to know, uh, be aware about this. Uh, as very often your plants are, are also involved, there are some even funny situations in a sense because there are some committees that say, well, if you build a biomethane gas here, we will never be able to produce power is on here. It's going to be a tragedy. Well, go and tell this to the president of the Italian Biogas Consortium if, you know, Parmigiano production and biomethane are incompatible. I'm saying this because this problem as well, just as the more global issues that we have faced, well, they can only be solved with a debate, promoting a, look, a debate at the local level. So environmentalists have always had to grapple with these problems in other contexts. Don't think that just because something is globally positive, then automatically it's going to be accepted locally. No. If you want to do something right, you still have to go about doing it right. So we must find a way to also explain to people at the local level, not just in Brussels or um, at the highest levels, because a given, why a given plant may be an opportunity for an area, why, for instance, a uh, farming will be functioning better, the fact that a farm is in a given area is a good thing for the entire area. Otherwise, it's going to be very difficult to make so many biomethane plants as we would like to build. Thank you. Thank you, Francesco Ferrante. He also made reference to some of the things that were said this morning by the young farmers who spoke about the importance of dialogue and their relationship with the local territory.